Hey, you paisans! Uh, <laughs> having a little fun today out here in the Easy Jeezy Garage. Welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to do an in-depth discussion on Weber IDF carbs. Everything you ever wanted to know about them, how to size them, how to tune them, what all the components on the carburetors do, uh, where did these concepts come from when was it established it's probably going to be a series of videos I don't think I can uh, bore you to death in just one video although some of you are probably fading out already so at any rate we're gonna have some fun today and I want to start off with the history behind these carburetors stay tuned I think this history of these Weber carburetors is going to have to include, or I'd like it to include, the whole automotive industry because that's really where the story goes. It, nobody just came up with one thing. It was a, a culmination of events and times and companies and people and discoveries that made all the stuff that we have today possible. And what we have today is truly unbelievable. Um, Eduardo Weber was born in 1889. He always had an affiliation with the Fiat Motor Company. He worked as an employee of theirs. He owned a dealership and sold their cars. He sold performance products to add onto their cars. He invented a two-barrel carburetor that included a supercharger somehow. It didn't give uh, a lot of detail on it and it didn't uh, uh, explain it too much more than that but uh, I, I just thought it'd be important what kind of time frame that you're thinking of and it was also back in this time that you had your uh, Ferraris and Maseratis, Italian cars, you had uh, German cars, your BMWs and Mercedes and you had English cars, Jaguars um, there's, a, there's a lot of a blend of, of cars and manufacturers across Europe that were trying to prove that they had a better product to people and they went to the track and that's where people wanted to see it. People used to race horses. It was natural that when cars replaced horses that they'd start racing those as well. And and that's exactly what was happening. They all strive to be the best. And the funny thing about Weber is he convinced all these people and made it such a good product that all of these people were, were at one time or another trying out these Weber cars. Some of them actually put them into production, which is probably why we still have the nostalgic feeling that we have towards them. Uh, when the Americans went to Europe to race in their 24 Hours Le Mans and their different uh, races, even back in the 30s and stuff, they came back to America and they wanted to, to create their own sports car. Carroll Shelby is well known for creating that uh, AC Cobra and putting uh, a small 289 Ford engine in it and one of the pictures of course you can you know it looked very similar to, to what you have here as far as the actual setup but it was one barrel per cylinder that is the most efficient way to run an engine and to burn that fuel and not to have complications with reversion. Anytime you have an open plenum or a connected plenum or more than one cylinder going to bear to a cylinder, you have problems with uh, uh, pulsing and, and reversion and it, it uh, takes away from the volumetric efficiency. Volumetric efficiency might be something that we want to touch on as well and we'll use fuel. I just realized uh, after reading these books recently that when you talk about fuel air ratio you're talking in pounds of weight you're not talking in volume necessarily it's a pound of fuel uh, div divided into 14 pounds of air and that air is always going to be a constant variable. We know this when you watch the news every night. They talk about low pressure and high pressure and so on and so forth. But where the pressure actually, uh, the concept of pressure comes from, for example, and it gives this example in the books, that if you had 
a one inch diameter column of air that reached from the surface of the ocean 60 miles up into the atmosphere um, it would weigh 14.7 pounds so this air that's all around us has a weight to it and the reason why we don't feel it is it because it's it's everywhere and I just grasp this concept that there's uh, not really vacuum that draws the fuel into an engine when the piston lowers it creates more area on that part of it and that 14 0.7 pounds of air pressure or close to that whatever it is at that time is what's pushing and in to that space it's not getting sucked into that space it's getting pushed into that space and somehow with all that math and uh, algebra geometry and stuff what what they come out is a stoichiometric volume which is the ratio of 14 parts of air to one pound of fuel. See, I just said it accidentally. 14 pounds of air. I said parts. And this is why I've, I'm going to have to twist my, wrap my head around this. And you may be thinking the same thing. Well, wait a minute. You must be confused. You, I've made mistakes. I've said things wrong before. But no, it's 14 pounds of air and one pound of fuel. A gallon of fuel weighs six pounds but you're not looking comparing that to a gallon of air it it's a the weight of air um i don't know how else to describe that i'm kind of amazed at that whole type of concept but this is the complexity of a carburetor it's trying to create that now with early european race cars and manufacturers they found and this is where the whole in internal combustion engine was first created in in Europe and uh, um, diesel engines and gas engines it, it, it was a crazy time um, you know just to touch on on fuels and stuff the main reason for the invention of these types of things was for light so that after dark you could have light to see and work and do things uh, once Volkswagen committed to making a full line of dual port heads. That was the big huge wake up call. It was the early 70s that CB Performance started mass producing these intake manifolds for the IDF Weber carb, the 40 IDF Weber carb specifically. And they made them and they worked because of the dual port head. It, we wouldn't have what we have today if it wasn't for CB Performance. CB Performance came out with that in the 70s, but they were getting the product, the Weber carburetor, from the Weber company. And Weber was associated with the Fiat company, and the Fiat company was having all kinds of uh, problems in their management and their family issues and so on and so forth. So it, it, it became very unreliable by the end of the 70s and everybody by the end of the 80s was done with carburetors I, people could see fuel injection coming it was coming in the 70s it just wasn't down to the cheap cars yet it was more in the in the exotic type cars and Volkswagen was one of the first ones to put it in a production car and that was pr pressured by emission standards no unleaded fuel uh, lower emissions. I mean, people could see the handwriting wall clear back in the 50s, but the laws and the hammer came down because there were horsepower wars going on in the 60s, and then in the 70s, it's like, uh-oh, we got to pull back, and we got to, we have to make these emission-friendly uh, type cars. And they, one of the big things was get rid of the lead, and one of the big things that lead did was it was an anti-knock compound. It prevented detonation in your engine, which was very destructive. Another thing that happened in uh, uh, automotive engines was they would use the head, the cast iron head, as the valve seat. And you would get micro welds between the valve and the valve seat. And that lead in the fuel prevented detonation 
and it also prevented that uh, surface from getting pitted out and ate out. It really wasn't so much for the intake valve, it was all about that exhaust valve and that was the one that they were having problems with and they went ahead and they changed that by putting in steel hardened steel seats under the valves but that's an extra expense another potential thing to go wrong and and another cost involved and that's why the price of everything keeps going up but now you know a little bit about what the heck was going on in that time period so Weber's were getting very unreliable to manufacturers or wholesalers like Redline of America and like uh, CB Performance and CB Performance uh, went ahead and, and contracted with Delorto and they became the United States uh, wholesaler distributor. I think it would be a, both a distributor and wholesaler for exclusive for Delorto carburetors and when they came up with the Delorto design they used uh, Weber as kind of a guideline and they the parts are not always interchangeable but the concept and and that sort of thing is and they made some improvements to it in the process of doing that and then holy macro here we are all these years later uh, the Delortos are are still a very fabulous carburetor but people still have it in their mind about these Weber carburetors and the AC Cobra and the Ferraris and Maseratis and English racing cars Jaguars and so forth all these guys were, were running the Webers and it's kind of like the ooh and awe ah and thing to have so I think what I'll do is uh, Call that the end of this first segment of the history portion of these Weber carburetors. And then in the next video, we're going to actually get in here with a screwdriver. I'm going to start describing what things are and how you can build your carburetor so you can bolt it on your car and, and start to get that thing to run better for you. Um, I'll have some outtakes of some uh, screw ups and attempts that I made. I had a request for that. I'll put those at the end of this video. I hope you like this stuff. I hope you give me a thumbs up. Give me a thumbs up now while you're looking at it and thinking at it. Those help me as in regard to YouTube. I, I appreciate you guys. If you're not subscribed, please do. I've got over 700 videos up there. This is kind of my little sales spiel at the end of this thing. And then I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and, and throw on some uh, funny outtakes on the end of it. And on our next video, we'll get into more of the meat and potatoes of this thing. How's that sound? Have a great day. Thanks for watching. Thanks for subbing. Easy Jeezy, out. Okay, so I'm having some fun today. <clears throat> It's a beautiful Corona day. <coughs> no, that's not that. I don't. That's not the Corona cough. That's just uh, me being old age. But I tell you, if I get going to a grocery store or something and I get that cough started, it's hard for me to stop it, and people start scattering. So I, what we're gonna do today? Hello everybody, my name is Eduardo Weber, welcome back to my garage. <laughs> Today I want to tell you a little bit about my life story. We're here in Bologna, Italy <laughs> and uh, I was born in uh, 1889. I'm not going to tell you my birth date or my social security number because it's not a good thing to do nowadays. But as a young man, even as a young boy, I worked for a short period of time at the Fiat car manufacturing company. And I realized that uh, I was kind of small and I did not like it to work that hard. So. Uh, I decided to move on to something else and I for a short term uh, learned how to make uh, conversion kits for automobiles so they could burn and run on gasoline because uh, kerosene 
Kerosene, I think it was. Yeah, I think it was kerosene. You know, when you get to be this old, your memory starts to fail you. So.